It's all your fault, you know. I was shaken to the core by these tender words from my beloved wife of just over five years. We lay pressed against each other, me behind her in a warm embrace, I felt very relaxed, defenseless, and ready to fall asleep after a very passionate lovemaking session. My wife, Katie, was the initiator, which is rare, she was very animated and seemed determined to kill me with kindness, which is rare, it was definitely a case for the record books, I never questioned good things, but apparently, even I should have been wary, the piper needs to be paid, e what? What did I do? Those were the only words I could squeeze out of my mostly shut down brain, which had gone into full defense mode. That's what we guys do when we confront our spouses. We go into full defense mode, knowing we've done something wrong, and we're going to pay for it, even if we have no idea what exactly we've done. Now I was tense, but didn't dare move, waiting for the revelation of what and how much I would have to pay for. I felt a light nudge in my ribs from the woman's elbow, not hard, just for effect. You could almost say it was playful. It's all your damn fault. According to the timetable, the plan was supposed to be in full force. By now, we would be in divorce court and I would be on my way to a reasonably cross for a single life. I was also supposed to be on the lookout for husband number two. Now I'm awake. What the fuck are you talking about? What's the plan? Are you out of your fucking mind? What you're saying doesn't make any sense? My voice was gaining volume and pitch, turning into a horrible male version of whiny. I rarely swore it, Katie, and here I was swearing and whining at the same time. She turned to face me as I lay back leaning on my elbow. She threw her soft leg over mine and ran her index finger over my lips. She began to whisper to me. Baby. Don't swear at me. It's all right. Just relax. I had to tell you something, and I didn't know how to tell you. So I just blurted it out. Just relax. Relax. I'd advise you not to get your panties in A but I seem to remember that you're not wearing them right now. I could see her smile in the dim light and she continued to whisper her assurances. That's it. Relax. Everything will be fine. You'll see. She took a deep breath. For the last month or so, I've been a real nerd to you until I left for my mom and sisters. I know that, subconsciously, it was part of my exit strategy. Exit strategy? I felt myself tense up again. Just relax. You'll figure it out soon enough. So I went on my little family reunion trip. And first, as you know, I visited my mom. Not only did I get to see her, but I also got a little support and advice on how to implement the plan. What I didn't count on was seeing her in her element and observing her life a bit. She lives in a great house, has some very cool cars. My favorite is a Maserati. She has young boy toys that she plays with and seems to have everything a woman could want if you love money, and the trappings of wealth. She has achieved all of this by developing and following the plan, a term she coined herself. The plan is simply to find some guy marry him and stay married for about 5 years, then you divorce him, get half the assets, and move on to the next husband, and it's all over again. My mom has been married 7 times, has 3 daughters from 3 different husbands is now divorced according to her for the last time, and is living very luxuriously. She told me it was time for me to move on with my life and gave me a list of things I should be sure to do and ask for during my divorce. You know, negotiation tips. You didn't know it, but you were about to be hung out to dry. That told me a lot. I always wondered why my wife never invited me to visit her mother or her sisters. It was like she was ashamed of me or something. In my mind, they were man-hating bitches, and I was just fly in their soup. I guess being kept out of the family get-togethers was a good thing, but it still didn't assuage my growing fear that it wouldn't end well. The fact that she told me about it was a small glimmer of hope, since bailiffs don't usually show up in your bedroom at night to serve you with divorce papers, it didn't make sense that she was going to give me a surprise gotcha statement right away, Katie continued. With renewed determination and even more ammunition, I went to see my older sister Janine. She seemed to be doing well. She just married husband number three and is living quite luxuriously. I met Trent, 
her new husband. He seemed pretty normal to me, but was generally pretty boring and kept squinting at me. Janine said he works as a sales rep and is away a lot, which is fine with her because he's pretty boring in bed, she said she couldn't wait for the five years to be over. She spoke with some fondness about her first husband, Tim, who she said was a fantastic lover and generally a good man, as far as she knows, he has remarried, has two children and seems quite happy. She recently got together with him. And at least now they can talk because he's no longer resentful or angry, but I highly doubt they will ever be friends. It's really sad, I always liked him and thought he was right for her. I've never met husband number two, Janine only married him because he was rich. Overall, I think he treated her pretty badly, I left Janine with some doubts, but not enough to undo the first step of the plan. Janine also gave me some tips on finding a good attorney to handle our divorce and some questions to ask to make sure the attorney is totally on board with what you need to do to get the most out of you. I was starting to get angry. The woman I loved and adored was nonchalantly telling me her plans for how she was going to destroy me, not only financially, but emotionally. Katie took a deep breath and calmed me down. Almost done. Hang in there you can speak up in another minute. I then went to visit Cheryl, she and I had a great time as we were very close when we were younger. She was married to Kyle for almost six years and divorced him two years ago. I told her that I had just gotten in from my mom and Janine, and she asked how they were doing. She also asked, which I thought was a little odd. Did they seem happy? I thought about it and replied that mom seemed content but still felt bitter when she mentioned the former men in her life. Cheryl said that she was sure that Janine's father had really put an imprint on mom, and partly on Janine to make them both hate men the way they do. To me, that was kind of a revelation. It kind of explained why mom came up with the plan in the first place and why she preached it to us all the time when we were growing up. It was a secret that we kept from our husbands and that bound us together in a sisterhood. We were always involved in plans for the process of appeasing our current husband and delaying until his five-year term was up. And then sort of pushing him out of our minds and hearts. It seemed that Cheryl and I could even do this to our own fathers, to whom we both felt close. We at least I really believe that this was the way it was done in all families. Until I got older and had friends whose father was the father of all the children, and still remained a member of the family. The funny thing is that all of this crap we thought was normal. Cheryl and I talked a lot about our dads, she's very close to her dad, and I adore my dad as you well know. My dad, at least to this day, is still very hurt and perplexed as to how my mom could just divorce him and kick him out. I think he wants answers. I'm sure he's still wondering what he did to his mom to push her away. Poor guy still doesn't know what to do. I may have to figure out a way to let him know without pushing mom away, I'll have to work on that. Anyway, as Cheryl and I were talking, I told her I was getting ready to start my version of the plan, and she got a very sad look on her face, then she sighed heavily. She told me that divorcing Kyle was the worst mistake of her life, she said that he loved her and treated her very well, and she in turn loved and cared for him. They were partners and friends and she hates that she gave in to pressure from her mom and Janine to go along with the plan. With tears in her eyes, she said the man who once adored her now hates her to the core and won't even talk to her. She tried to contact him, but he got a restraining order against her harassment. She started dating again, but is looking for another Kyle she can't find. She then looked at me intently and asked me if I was happily married. I was forced to admit that I was. I thought about it some more and realized that I am very, very happy, and it would hard for me to replace you. Besides it was the first time I thought about what you would think and feel if I just divorced you, how could I do that to you? I'm ashamed to admit it, but the thought never even crossed my mind before. How stupid is that, I just stared. I'm sure with a fair amount of horror at my Katie, horrified that this woman I loved could think in such terms with no regard for me or my feelings. For all the time we'd been together, shocked that she would even talk about it like it was some random event, 
angry that other people outside of our life together could have had such influence over her that they encouraged her to break up with us without regard for our feelings, and that was part of her deeply ingrained belief system. I was also hurt and resentful that this could be our end. I felt helpless and angry and was on the verge of tears, Katie just looked at me with tears in her eyes. I know, baby, and I'm so sorry, I know this all sounds so crazy, it sounds crazy even to me now that I've had a chance to think about it all, Katie stroked my cheek and pulled my head to hers for a kiss, a soft kiss of hope and gratitude, and then she whispered to me in a husky voice full of emotion. I knew at once. I knew without a doubt that I could never let you go. I couldn't divorce you over some stupid plan that arose from hurting my mom years ago. I love you too much. I will never ever be able to find anyone else who makes me feel the way you can and love me the way you keep proving to me I'm afraid you're stuck with me unless, of course, you realize that I'm too crazy to live with me and decide to carry out the plan yourself. The ball is now in your court. You have to make a decision, I've already called my mom and sisters and told them that the plan is no longer a part of my plans and my life, I'm yours until you can't take me anymore. All doubt and anger vanished the second she said those words. I was sure. I was relieved, I was in love. We were making love again with more passion and intensity than we probably had since our honeymoon, two people reaffirm their love and commitment to each other in a way that only happens when they both feel and believe it to the core. We cuddled again in the same pose we had before her confession when she whispered, now that we're stuck with each other, maybe we should discuss those children you so insistently hinted about. I stood next to the hospital bed on which lay the frail cancer-stricken body of Katie my wife for 62 years that had flown by all, all too quickly, I held her hand trying desperately to stay on my feet. At the opposite end of the room from the bed, sat our four children, their spouses, and several of our older grandchildren. Our twelve-year-old granddaughter Jenny looked at me intently and asked, What were you thinking, Poppy? The perceptive stinker always seemed to know when my thoughts were far away. I was thinking about the time when I knew for sure that your grandmother really loved me. I smiled at the memory but I felt sick at the realization that our life together would soon be over. Katie's suffering would soon be over and I would only have to wait for my turn. I felt a light touch on my arm. Katie's eyes were open and clear, and her breathing was even time in days. I sensed that she wanted me to move closer to her, I leaned in, and she kissed me gustily with dry lips. She tried to speak and her voice was strained and squeaky. I've had a wonderful life, my love, her big brown eyes gleamed warmly. It's all your fault, you know.